cloud. All right. <coughs> this quote still in the space of private virtue from George Washington. Arbitrary power is most easily established on the ruins of liberty abused to licentiousness. Ooh. Licentiousness is um, promiscuous and unprincipled in sexual matters. So it's kind of interesting that um, according to George Washington here, that's the easiest way to uh, exert tyranny or arbitrary power is that if you've given people liberty and they go crazy with it, they're uh, ready to lose their liberty. Kind of interesting. Okay, let's take a look at, let's see, let's save that. A couple things coming up. So of course, next week is the midterm exam. Remember that midterm exam is administered in the testing center. Uh, and so you need to go and uh, take it Monday through Friday. Friday is a late day which means uh, you'll have to pay $5 for the privilege of taking the exam if you wait all the way till Friday to take it. Uh, but uh, free, of course, to take for the rest of the time. The paper and pencil exam. You've got a study guide here that uh, will take you through what I think are the important things to get ready for the exam. Uh, things to learn and make sure you're comfortable with. We will have, let's come to the online tab, we will have a review session on Saturday morning at nine o'clock. So I've got the, I've got that set up here on Zoom. That will be a Zoom meeting. And the format of that will be, you're gonna come with your questions to ask about, <clears throat> about the midterm. So hopefully you've had some time to go through the uh, midterm study guide by then and at least look over the things that you think hmm could use a little refresher on this and I will answer questions then in preparation for that exam. Any questions on the midterm exam? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Well, sounds like there's a question. We'll need to get the so, microphone. Yeah. Can you hear me, Professor? I can, yes. Yeah. So the question is, can we watch this later? Like the uh, this class recording? Review the review session. Can you watch that later? Certainly, yes. I will I will record it and I will make it available just the same way. Well, the other the other uh, videos I tend to make available on the blog. They're also available here under uh, uh, cloud recordings. So um, it'll just show up here in the list of all the other recordings. So you'll find that in the online tab of Learning Suite. Oh, whoops, we're showing you on the wrong screen. So <clears throat> I think this is probably, even though I'm as a student view, I think it's probably my view because I see that I've got a publish button here. But uh, on the online tab, you've got your upcoming meetings, which is where you would go to join an existing meeting or a meeting that's getting ready to happen. Uh, but then under cloud recordings is where you'll have all the old videos. So this video I will not publish onto the blog because it's not going to be relevant to folks except folks that are here in this class. And so uh, we'll just leave it here as a part of Learning Suite. Other questions? All right, so we are going to set the Wayback Machine to the 1970s. I know that's before you were born. Um, I was a young person in the 1970s. I was born in 1968. So beginning of the 1970s, I was just a couple of years old. <clears throat> and let's suppose that you know we're in a we're running a bank. Uh, early 1970s, if we're running a bank, we're not. <clears throat> already using computers, we are behind the times, but it's still new innovation for banks. And so let's imagine that we've got to uh, develop a screen to be able to handle a cash deposit. So what kind of information are we going to need to be able to collect from our users to be able to make a cash deposit? We will just come here and kind of pretend we've got a little computer screen here, make that maybe black on the background. Interesting. So we've got some black screen. Let's make the font 
maybe light green on it. Oops. Okay, so what information are we going to need to be able to collect from the user to make a cash deposit into an account? A little bit tougher here to do this over Zoom, uh, but maybe if you just kind of called some idea out, we could have Matthew just echo that to me so I can hear it. it looks like someone's making a, uh, okay, so someone on chat has given us, said we'll have to give the account number. I think absolutely right. So we need to have the account number. Here's the account number, and maybe we'll just make it, make this background kind of a light green color and black text. What else are we gonna need? So the amount of the deposits? Yeah, I think that's probably all we really need. It's a pretty simple transaction. So we've got the account number and the deposit. It's 1970s, there's no mouse. <clears throat> we've got a screen like this and we're going to type this stuff in, hit enter, and it's going to collect that information. Now, um, what is the, what's the risk uh, about having a teller type this information in? What's the problem that could happen here? So typo. Yeah, typographical error is going to be the problem. And let's let's kind of focus on the typographical error happening in the account code. Suppose we have an account that's one, two, one, two, three, four, five, six is the account number. And it's a little hard for me to see. I think the screen I'm working on is a little bit uh, deficient here, but <clears throat> so we're going to get a typographical error. So how are we going to how are we going to have some assurance? that the number is entered correctly. Because if someone, I mean, if, if we type in the amount correctly and get the wrong account number, then we're going to take that money away from the person and we're going to credit the wrong account for having that. Uh, and that's going to be a real problem. So how are we going to get some assurance that we've got the account number uh, typed in correctly? Now, it's really hard for us to think about what computer systems were like in the 1970s. But a lot of things that we take for granted today just are non-starters in the 1970s. For example, if, if uh, our solution is, well, why don't we just go ahead and, and uh, do a database lookup with that account number and just check to make sure it's the name of the person we're expecting it to make, that's a non-starter because it takes so long to do, number one, disk, disk access takes a long time. Uh, but in this case, more importantly, um, uh, telecommunications are really slow still. So if we say, yeah, just go ahead and, and, and do a database lookup uh, you know, from this remote branch, it's probably gonna take 30 seconds or so to be able to get that information to come back. So <laughs> we've got to come up with something that can happen locally, preferably without any disk access at all, and yet to be able to be pretty comfortable that we've gotten the right account number here. Any thoughts? What might you do yeah. to be able to get pretty good assurance of the account number? So ask him to put in the account number twice. All right, so we could have them type it in twice and that will work pretty well, uh, except if they've made the answer. Um, I mean, if the, if the error is happening uh, as it's being read, if the transposition of a digits are happening when it's being read, then they will most likely type exactly the same account number wrong twice. Uh, and so that is gonna be a, that's gonna be a problem. Now, so in chat, we're seeing, uh, make sure it's the right length. So we know how long it's supposed to be. So, uh, you know, at least make sure it's the right length. In fact, if they had it the wrong length, then that's not nearly as bad because that wouldn't actually accidentally map onto another account number. So um, other options here, you might say, well, you know, we could have two people, two different people type it. Ah, that's gonna get expensive as well because now we've gotta have essentially double the labor in terms of making this. You gotta have two people to do it. So that's gonna be pretty expensive as well. Any other thoughts? Ask for the customer to verify, uh, it's coming in from chat. <coughs> Trouble is most customers have no idea what their account number is. Uh, at least for sure in the 1970s, 
I'm kind of always surprised at how well my wife is able to kind of just rattle off various account numbers that she uses uh, regularly at banks and so forth. But I think that's going to be a, a rare situation for most of the banking customers in the 1970s. We'll take a couple more thoughts and I'll tell you what they came up with in the, uh, back in the day. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to bear pretty heavily on what we're doing today in class. Any other thoughts? Did they make like crazy formulas so that there has to be some check digit at the end? That's exactly what the, what what they came up with. Something called a check. Initially, it was a check. It was called a check sum. So, in other words, we've got this. These six digits are going to be enough to identify the account itself. But then, and this is the kind of the first thing we did was we said, all right, well, if we know that <laughs> this account number is one two three four five six. Let's see. Uh, that is uh, 11, 15, 21. So we're going to add up those six digits, and then we will just make two more characters as the actual account number. And this, these two characters are what's referred to as the check sum. Uh, it is just the sum of the real six digits. So when we create the account number, the account number now is eight digits long, only six are used to identify the account, and then two more are used to make sure that we've typed those six correctly. This isn't really where we ended up. This is our first kind of putting our toe into this water about how this would work. This works pretty well, because now if any one of these numbers is wrong uh, or mistyped, then the checksum won't be right for those first six digits. So that's pretty good. It's going to make it, you know, you've got to have a, a counterbalancing mistake to be able to come up with what with, uh, uh, with a valid account number. Uh, and then kind of having those two mistakes would be uh, pretty rare to have those two mistakes happen in typing that number just once. Um, and the nice thing about this is, is that it requires, it allows us to do some, we have to do some, you know, pretty lightweight math but it's not, it doesn't involve telecommunications, it doesn't involve uh, disk access, and so this will be pretty quick for us in the 1970s. So we like this pretty much, but what's the, what's the real problem with this particular approach? Yeah, so this came in on, uh, on uh, chat. Uh, there's a problem if the numbers are transposed, that's right. So um, the, most, uh, the most common error is just mistyping one digit. The second most common error is transposing two sequential numbers. And so if we transpose any two numbers here, as long as we've got all the right digits, the order doesn't matter, it's gonna produce this, this uh, 21 is gonna be the checksum. <coughs> and so they said, let's get, the, let's get it to be a little bit more sophisticated. Um, and we'd also like to reduce this down to just one digit here at the end that we are using to identify, um, you know, to, to validate the number. So we're gonna get rid of the, so that we only have one digit at the end. So here's now one digit, to check digit. And we're gonna make the math be a little bit more complicated here. And, and the real goal here is to say, we want to be able to have some kind of an algorithm that we can run on these first six characters that will produce the two here at the end. And we want it to be protected against number one, if any one of these characters is in, if any one of these numbers is wrong, we want to make sure it doesn't produce a two. And then the second character that we'd like to have from a check digit algorithm is we would like to be able to say if any two sequential numbers are transposed. So if the five and the six are transposed, if the two and the three are transposed, then, then we want to make sure that it doesn't accidentally give us the right check digit uh, for that as well. Uh, yeah, and so they came up with that in the 1970s, and it worked really well, so well that it's been that that, that idea of a check digit uh, has been in use ever since. Um, and their check digits are all over the place. You don't know their check digits, but if you ever have some kind of account number that someone has to type in, I guarantee you there is going to be a check digit built into it. And today we're going to talk specifically about check digits that are used in the International Standard uh, Book Number ISP. International Standard Book Number will be uh, doing an example of that here in class. Uh, <coughs> and 
And I think I almost got to tell this other story just because it's a fun story to tell. Uh, who can tell me who Frank Abagnale Jr. is? Have you heard of him? The, the catch me if you can guy. Catch me if you can guy. Yeah, that's right. Uh, he was a financial instrument fraud genius. Um, ultimately, he will uh, get caught by the FBI, do quite a bit of time in prison in various countries. Um, but uh, now I believe he's a consultant, either works for the FBI or he's a consultant for the FBI. Uh, and he's uh, kind of helping them catch uh, crooks that, uh, that um, you know, doing the kind of things that he used to do. So, but this was his very, very, <laughs> his very first financial instrument fraud, which uh, I thought was just so interesting. I'll just tell you the story because it's fun. So <laughs> he noticed that, um, you know, if, if uh, you know, someone gets their checks, you know, maybe Edna has her uh, social security check and she's going to walk into the bank and she's going to fill out a deposit slip to deposit that check. Now, if she has her checkbook with her, she'll probably pull a deposit slip out of the checkbook and she'll fill out the information. And that one that's in her checkbook is pre-printed with her account number. Uh, and that works really well. But if she didn't have her checkbook with her, she'll just go pick up a deposit slip off of the counter, a counter deposit slip. And she'll fill it out. She does not know her account number. And so when Edna takes the check and the deposit slip up to the teller, the teller has to look up the account number. But Frank Abagnale Jr. realized that the account number was there. They didn't actually have you know, any need to verify that it was really the account number that they intended it to be. And so um, what he did was he went in, walked into the bank, and picked up a whole stack of deposit slips right there off the, right there off the counter took him back to his apartment, rolled them into a typewriter one at a time, and typed his account number onto the deposit slip. Uh, and then he took that stack of deposit slips right back and put them right back onto the counter at the, at the bank. So now when Edna comes in and uses a counter deposit slip to make her deposit, she probably still fills it out the way she has in the past, that is, she's put her name on it, um, but she doesn't notice that there's already an account number written onto it. And so, uh, she will then go and deposit her check. The teller then takes the um, takes the deposit slip, says, "Oh, there's an account number typed right in here." She would type he or she would type in the uh, account number, and Edna's check would get deposited into Frank's account. Um, uh, and then after a week, he you know wrote a check to uh, clear out that account, and then disappeared. So uh, really kind of interesting. <clears throat> so there were some holes in the process back then, uh, but that's kind of how we got started. All right, so we're going to be talking here uh, about check digits, and specifically, we're going to be uh, talking about what is it going to take to validate a 10-digit ISBN. So let's take a look here. Okay, so here is just the Wikipedia page on international standard book numbers. There are um, I guess if you're really familiar with it, you can tell different kinds of things about a book by its ISBN. So which uh, country was it published in? Um, there's a lot of information in the ISBN that if you're familiar with, you can track it down. But all I'm really interested in is being able to do the check to, to perform the check digit algorithm. Okay, so there are actually, uh, until 2007, international standard book numbers had 10 characters. Uh, beginning in 2007, they said, you know what, we're going to have a, um, a different standard for the international standard book number, and it's going to allow for a 13-character uh, ISBN. Interestingly, uh, on the 10-digit version, there's nine digits identify the book plus a check digit. Well, if you have a 13-digit ISBN, those nine digits that identify the book are the same in both of the ISBNs. Uh, the check digit ends up being different because it's a different algorithm. And then there's some other characters on the front of the ISBN because that allows it to be a product, kind of a general UPC uh, product number uh, rather than just something that's, that's uh, you know, only in the space for books. So what we're going to do in class today is we are going to implement a, uh, a validation routine for a 10-digit ISBN. 
you're going to have a project on this where you're going to do something similar, very similar, in fact, but you are going to implement the check digit algorithm for the 13 digit ISBN. So the stuff that we're doing in class today is going to be really relevant to the stuff that you're doing on the next project. So let's see, we've got this here. Let's go ahead and jump into some code. Bring open my code window. And I don't think I'm going to need VBA open much at all, or Excel open much at all. Let me just see if I can get back to where the check digit formula is spelled out. Here we go. Okay. So here's the idea. <laughs> here's the idea is we want to be able to have um, create something that will allow us to. Uh, ask a question uh, to basically say, hey, I've got a candidate ISBN. I want to check to see if it's well-formed. And so we're going to come over here and make a procedure that allows us to do that. Now, every time we've made a procedure so far, it's been a sub-procedure. We start with the keyword sub. Uh, we give it some name. Is valid ISBN 10. And this would be a sub-procedure. But what I'm going to do now is something that's completely different. And that is, we are going to make a function procedure. Function procedures and sub procedures are really similar to each other. They're both blocks of VPA code that allow us to say, here's a set of instructions that I want to run together as a unit. The real difference is, is that when the function procedure is done, it sends a value back to where it was called from. So let me just, and here's the, here's the way that we actually say what this value is going to return. I'm going to set the name of the function, in this case, is valid ISBN 10 equals to some value. So now that I've created it's a very simple function, uh, it's called is valid ISBN 10. It doesn't take any arguments. We're going to change that here in just a minute. But this function always returns true. And so if I print is valid ISBN 10. Um, it's just going to give me the result true. So when we say that the function returns a value, it really is just putting it back to where the call was made. And so here, I've called it from the immediate window. This would be, <clears throat> so I, I just said print is valid ISBN 10, and it prints true. That's because before it can print is valid ISBN, it has to go figure out what this evaluates to. And so the, the interpreter goes and it runs all the code and it realizes, ah, it's sent back true. And then it prints that result. So that's why we printed true here. Uh, and we can call this from a lots of different places, right? We could come into, we could have another sub procedure in here. And we could call the function from here. Uh, let's do this. Let's do, let's put it into a, put it into a cell. So let's say uh, range A1. Dot value equals is valid ISBN 10. And I should be able to run that. <clears throat> and now it'll evaluate true. It will return true right to here. So it'll be just exactly the same as if I had said true, just put true into ISBN 10, or I'm sorry, into range A1. Uh, because it's going to go and evaluate this and return its value right to the place where it was executed from. So if I look over here on A1, I should see that we've got the value true in there. Incidentally, we can also do it from inside of a cell. Is, I'm zooming here a bit. Equals is valid, ISBN 10. And we can see that that now goes and runs that function <coughs> and returns its value right to the same place that it was called from. Okay, any questions on the notion of having a function? It is just a block of VBA code. We can have any number of statements in here that we want. The trick is when it's done executing, it's gonna send back a value. Questions here?
Oh, I just checked up here in the chat and apparently someone uh, uh, pointed out that Frank Abagnale Jr. was a BYU professor. Uh, he does in his autobiography, uh, Catch Me If You Can, he does claim to have gotten a job in the psychology department here at BYU and taught uh, for about a year. Um, the university instantly denies that. I'm not quite sure who to believe on this one. Anyway, questions on, on the idea of a function. I assume you can send arguments to that function as well. Yeah, of course, that's gonna be the whole idea. What we're gonna do is we're gonna end up passing a value to this function. And then the function is gonna look at the value we pass in, it's gonna return true. If it's a well-formed ISBN, it will return false if it is not a well-formed ISBN. Now, um, so a couple more things before we get there though. First is that because the function returns a value, we are going to specify what type of value it's going to return. So if I was to dim x as a Boolean, then I'm declaring a variable x and I'm giving it a data type as Boolean. Well, we give functions a data type the same way. So here, I'm just gonna say, after the de de declaration of the function right there on the first line, I'm gonna say uh, as a data type, and that will be the data type that this returns. So now that this is Boolean, the only thing it can possibly return is true or false. And in fact, if we don't tell it to return true, if we don't actually set the value, it will return the default value for Boolean. Do you know what the default value for Boolean is? Well, the default value for any numeric integer, for any numeric variable is going to be zero. Uh, and so because under the hood, Boolean is um, implemented as a number anyway, then zero is going to be false. And so that's what they decided to make the default value for Boolean. So uh, if we don't ever tell this to be true, it will return false. So in fact, I could just comment this line out, never tell it to return anything. And now this will return false because it's returning its default value. We never told it anything different, so it'll have to return the default value. Okay, so now let's go ahead and see uh, and, and pass a value into this. So you'll remember that's the one thing we do inside these parentheses is I can declare a variable that will get its value when the function is called. So I'm gonna call that the candidate. And we'll take this in as a string. Now, <clears throat> reason we're gonna take it in, reason we're gonna take it in as a string, it turns out a 13 digit ISBN is all numeric, but a 10 digit ISBN is all numeric except for one possibility. And let's see if we can find an example. Uh, here's uh, here's one zero. Kind of the first interesting thing is it can have a leading zero, and so if we were to take it in as a number, uh, those leading zeros would disappear. That would be a problem for us. But it's very possible to have an X as the final character in an ISBN, and so we'll definitely want to take that candidate in as a string. Um, and then I think we're ready to start working on. Uh, you know, exactly what it would take for us to be able to implement the algorithm to be able to calculate what the check digit is. Any questions before we jump in to do that? Okay, as we look at how these uh, ISBNs, we have some pictures of them up here. As we look at what various ISBNs are, what you're gonna see is that there's really no standard about how these things are going to be uh, spaced off. A lot of times ISBNs are shown with no hyphens in them. Sometimes instead of hyphens, they'll have spaces or dots. And so here's what we wanna do. We wanna say, listen, if it's any character that we're not expecting, what character are we expecting? We're expecting zero through nine, and in our case, X. 
um, in the case for the pro project that you will be doing, the 13-digit ISBN validator, um, there's no X involved. And so you're going to say, if it's any character other than 0 through 9, we want to just ignore it. And so I'm going to look at this number, and I'm going to say, listen, if there's a dash in it, ignore it. If there's a space in it, ignore it. In fact, if there's any, as I look at each character one by one, if it's any character besides uh, 0 through 9 or x, just ignore it. So <clears throat> that's going to be the first thing that we're going to do. So in fact, even though we're building this function called isValidISBN, maybe having another function that we're working with uh, would be a more beneficial place to start. So let's make another function here, and we'll come back to the main one in just a minute. So let's call this function um, valid chart. And we'll pass in some data as a string. And we'll have it return uh, a string. Right, so what we wanna do is we want to look at every character that gets passed in to this variable data. And we're going to say, let's see, why don't I just put a little note here for what we're doing. We're going to ignore all characters that are not numeric, not numbers, or X. So if we were to pass into this, we're to pass into valid characters. Let me just go ahead and copy this one. And we would want valid characters to return nine, seven, eight, skip the hyphen, three, skip the hyphen, one, six. So just give me out the characters that are valid characters. Suppose, let's take this down to a 10-digit ISBN. We'll get rid of those. And I'll put the check digit as an X. There are 10 digits there. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Yeah. So what I would expect this to do is I expect this to send back to me this is what I would expect this to print out once I've got my valid characters function written correctly. Once I've gotten rid of characters that might be used just for spacing things out, then it's going to be a lot easier to work with because now I could do some checks immediately on, on this and tell if it's, if it's not a valid ISBN. I mean, there's some, some check I could do really quickly. In fact, once I've narrowed it down to just the valid, just the characters that can be a part of the ISBN, what check could I do to see if it's, and I already know this could not possibly be a valid 10 digit ISBN. Any thoughts? Well, it turns out that uh, a 10 digit for, for a 10 digit ISBN to be valid, it's got to have 10 digits. And so once I've gotten rid of anything in here that might just be for formatting, then I can just look at it and say, hey, if it's not 10 characters, we're done. It's not, it's not valid. And plus the, but you know, kind of one extra thing is that by then, if we know that it is uh, we know that it's 10 digits and we know. And then we've got a, we, we have a little more easy time working through it because we now know the length. We now know that we've got the right number of characters to work with, and that's going to make our life a little bit easier. All right, so let's do this function valid characters to get ourselves going. I'm going to declare a couple of variables x as an integer, maybe as a byte, um, just to be going you know, to allow me to look at the characters that get passed in one at a time. And let me go ahead and make a loop. We'll do a for loop for x equals one to the length of data. Wait, but can the x 
or can the byte handle the x, the possible x value at the end? So data is what's taking these values in. So I'm going to take this string, I'm going to pass it to valid chars, and it's going to get accepted into this variable called data. So the x will be here. What byte is going to do is just going to be a control variable that allows me to look at to go to count from one to the length of data. So whatever is in data, however long that is, x is going to go across the range one to that length. So for passing in 13 characters, this loop will iterate while x is one. It will go again, x is two, again, x is three, all the way up until x is 13, and then it will be done. So we're never going to put anything besides a number into x. If there's a follow-up question on there, go ahead and, and uh, let me know. Otherwise, we're headed, we're moving on. Yeah, that, that makes sense. OK, so uh, in fact, let's do this. Make our lives, it'll make our code a little bit easier. Let me dim a variable called one char as a string. This is just going to be to isolate one character at a time to look at it. Um, and I'll go out, let me just show you this. This is not something we're ever going to test you on. But you'll remember, well, I might expect you to remember that there's four bytes of overhead for a string variable. But, um, but remember that there is four bytes of overhead for every string. So how, how much um, RAM does it take to store a string? Well, it takes one byte for every character that you put into it, plus four bytes to keep track of how long it is. Um, but if I'm going to say, listen, I know exactly how long this is going to be. It's always going to be one character that I can actually say this is a fixed length string. So by putting star one here, it's a little bit strange syntax, but that says, okay, this is just going to be one, a one character length string. And it can't ever be more than one character. It can't ever be less than one character. And so that will be exactly one character. Um, it saves us a little bit of memory. But I just thought, would, in case you're interested in that, you can, um, you, know, you can actually make a fixed length string rather than a variable length string variable. Uh, if you're wondering why would I ever do that, just to save four bytes of RAM, you don't ever have to do this. Um, I'm just doing it to kind of point out another thing about VBA. OK, so now here's what I'm going to do is I'm going to give that, looking at one character at a time, I'm going to go ahead and, and read off the first character off of data and put it into this one char variable for me to look at. One char equals, and we've got the mid function. So mid function is going to look at a particular string data, whatever got passed in. I'm going to look at the x character and take one character. So the first time through this loop, one char is going to get set to equal. Well, it's going to look at data, whatever got passed in. In this case, you know, 3 dash, 16 dash, and so forth. It's going to look at the first position uh, because x is 1 the first time through this loop. And so it'll look right here. It'll, it'll take something out of the middle of the string, starting at the first position, and only taking one character. So that's just going to be the 3. So if I do a debug.print here, a one char, uh, then this should print three, and then on the next line, dash, then one, then six. Actually, let me just go ahead and put a breakpoint here so we can kind of see this go. Oops, that's not min, that's mid. All right, so I'm just going to step through this with F8. And it's going to print my first character, should be the three. Next time through, it's going to print the dash, then the one, then the six, just going through that one character at a time. So now my loop is processing those characters. It's processing the characters that I passed in one at a time. Now what I want to do is just check to see if it's a valid character. And so <coughs> we could be a little more sophisticated about this because, because really x is only valid as the 10th character. So we can have all, all, all of the numbers can show up in 10 digit ISBN 0 through 9. They can show up kind of anytime, anywhere. x can only show up as the 10th character 
Um, and we could be a little more sophisticated about this, but let's just say, listen, if it's a number or it's X, then that's going to be uh, a valid character. All right. So I'm just making an if statement here. I'm going to say if. Now, it happens that there's a function. Did we talk about this? Did we talk about uh, built in functions uh, last time? I don't remember. There is a function called is numeric. N U M E R I C. Is numeric looks at a string and returns true if it can be converted into a number. So let me just go ahead and play with this one for a minute. So is numeric, and if I put in here three, the answer is yes, that's true. Three is numeric. Uh, 3.4, that's numeric. Uh, three point, that's numeric. Point by itself is not numeric. So three point is numeric, point three is numeric, but point all by itself is not numeric. Um, some longer number, that's numeric. So what we're going to do is we're going to use that to let us know if the character we're looking at, and it's only one digit long because one character is only one digit. We're just going to check to see if one char is numeric or one, how about this, the uppercase of one char. is equal to capital X. And let's just go ahead and put our debug.print statement now inside of this if statement. And let's run this again. Okay, so we should see this printing off. And let's go ahead and go through. So one char gets established. Now the first time through, it should be the three. So it, it sh this should be true. It comes in, it'll print the three. Now the next time through, it's gonna be looking at that hyphen. Uh, it's not, that hyphen is not a capital X and it's not numeric. So we should skip that part of the code. So we skipped that one. Now we're gonna to get to the one, print the one. Now we'll get to the six, print the six. Okay, so now we have successfully written a little if statement here that will, that will keep track of these. I'm gonna go ahead and run this the rest of the way out. So take my breakpoint off and run it. And let's just make sure that we get to the X at the end. Yeah, we do. <coughs> so it looks like we processed that just the way that we would have expected to process it. So now. We're not returning the value yet, but we can see that our code is addressing each character individually, and it's behaving differently if it's a number that's a keeper, we're printing those out for now, or if it's one to throw away. So right now, anything that we're throwing away just isn't being printed. Our next step is gonna to be to accumulate the values that we want to save so that we can send them back. And so to do that, I'm going to create another variable. This one I'm going to call, I'll just call it temp, the temporary string. S-T-R-I-G. S-T-R-O, dim temp as a string. Okay, so instead of printing one char here, why don't I say that temp is going to be equal to what it used to be concatenated with the new character. So now, the first time through, um, by the way, what's the default value for any, for any string variable? Is a zero length string. So even though we haven't told us what to start at, it's going to start off as a zero length string. So the first time we hit this statement here, we're gonna say temp is gonna equal what? Well, it's going to equal what it is right now, a zero length string concatenated with the character that we've identified as a keeper. 
And so the next time through that also, which will be three the first time through. The next time we hit this line, it's gonna be the one, it's gonna be out for that one right there. So temp is gonna equal what it currently is, three concatenated with the one. And so by doing this, we're going to accumulate all the values or all the characters that we've identified as passing the check. And we'll store those into this temp variable. And then we can use that temp variable to return the value uh, to the function. So we're building up temp through this little loop right here. And then we're saying, great, now temp is by the end of the loop, temp has all the, the, the uh, valid characters and we're just gonna send that right back. So we should be able to run this now and it should give us back the valid characters. One thing that would probably make our life a little bit easier is if this O is return uh, capital X when there's an X to deal with. And so let's go ahead and do this. Let's just say that temp is equal to temp and the uppercase of one char. Or maybe when we read it in, let's do it this way. When I read it in, let's take the uppercase version of it. So now when I take, when I use the mid function to read off the current value for one character, I'm gonna say, just go ahead and convert it to uppercase. Now numbers, when you convert them to uppercase, they stay numbers. So uppercase of two is still two. But now that we know that our character has gotta be uppercase if it's, a, if it's actually a character, I don't have to be checking for it here. So I don't have to push this to uppercase here for the comparison because once it's in one char, we already know that it's uppercase. And then when we concatenate one char on, it'll already be uppercase. So now instead of giving us back a lowercase x on the end, it'll convert that to uppercase. Which will just make our code a little bit simpler if we know that the only character that's non-numeric that we have to deal with is an uppercase x. Okay, so this is our first function. Um, and it looks like it's kind of written and ready to go. How are we feeling about this? Any questions? All right. So now we've got our function is valid ISBN. And the first thing I think we want to do is we want to take, listen, whatever you passed in, let's go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and reduce it to just its valid characters. So we'll declare another variable here. Maybe I'll call this one ISBN as a string. And then we're going to set ISBN equal to valid chars. Of our candidate. Let me go ahead and put a breakpoint there. And let's go ahead and instead of calling valid chars here. I'm going to call this now with is valid ISBN. So ISBN now has uh, the result of whatever valid, valid charge returned. So here I passed in this number in as my candidate. I then passed that candidate forward to the valid charge function. So this calls valid charge down here and puts candidate into data. So now we go through this and we process that the same way that we've processed before. When it's done, it puts its value here into ISBN. And so we've got that. And so we can see that now we've got that, we've got that set up. So at this point, I can do a pretty quick check and be sure that um, you know, if, it's, if this is not 10 characters, there's no way that this is valid 10-digit ISBN because 10-digit ISBNs have to have 10 digits. 
So now I'll just do a pretty quick check right here. And I'm just going to say if the length of ISBN is different from 10, then hmm, I could just I could just exit the function. So remember that because this is a Boolean function, if I don't ever tell it to return true, it will return false. Let me go ahead and comment out my stop for a moment. And I'll say, listen, if we make it all the way to the bottom here, then we're gonna go ahead and set ISBN, is valid ISBN 10 to true. So now if I'm passing in 10 characters, this should return true. If I'm passing in something different from 10 characters, it should return false. So I'll go ahead and take off one of these to start with. And that looks pretty good. What if I, what if I have too many characters? That's false as well. So we're getting our first check here to just say if it, doesn't have 10 characters, it can't be right. All right, so now if we make it to here, we know we've got 10 characters to work with. So let's go ahead and Hmm. Let's deal with the first nine. So we've got the check digit that was passed in is going to be our 10th character. So let's go ahead and create a variable to hold that. So let's dim check digit as a string. And after we get to this point, I think we're ready to just separate off that check digit and then we're uh, ready to work with it. So let's go ahead and read the rightmost one character of our ISBN and put that into the check digit variable. Once we've done that, I think I'm going to take my ISBN and I'm going to make it just the leftmost nine characters. So I don't want to have to, I'm separating off the check digit and I'll work with the other nine to calculate what the check digit should be. And then we'll compare that to see what the check digit actually is, what the, what the check digit was supplied is. So ISBN is going to equal the leftmost nine characters of ISBN. All right. <laughs> so here, I think I'm ready to uh, start to implement the algorithm. This algorithm is not that complicated. It is, it's a little daunting to look at it for the first time. But basically what it says is pretty simple. Let me just get this to go a little bit wider. Okay. Oops. Okay, here's the example. So looking at this particular 10 digit ISBN, it's looking at these first nine characters and this algorithm is going to calculate what the check digit should be. And so the algorithm says, all right, we're gonna start off by taking the first character and we're gonna multiply it by 10. We'll take the second character 
and we're going to multiply it by nine. We'll take the third character and we'll multiply it by eight uh, and so forth, all the way down to the last character and multiply it by two. So that's the first thing that we're going to do. So let's go ahead and, and get that part built. Since I'm going to be iterating across all those characters, I'm probably going to want to control variables. So let's just go ahead and dim x as a long integer here, oops, as a, as a byte here. And then let's also create a check sum that we'll kind of use to kind of build up this calculation. And that one we'll take as, uh, as an integer. So now I'm going to do something similar that we had down below and just 4x equals 1, 2. Hmm. We don't have to ask how long it is because we know if we've made it here, our ISBN is now nine characters. So we'll just say 1 to 9. And so if I think about what I have to do here, I am going to say that my checksum is going to equal, now in this case, we are going to, <coughs> we've got to get that first character off. So let's go ahead and do our, let's go ahead and do our, our same thing with one char here as well. So we dim one char as a string. Checksum is, uh, let's go ahead and define one chart here. Mid of ISBN, starting at the X character and taking one character. So checksum is now gonna be equal to, and I'm going to kind of write this out by hand before I figure out exactly how the loop's all gonna work with it. So the first time through, checksum is going to equal what it used to be plus, and then it's gonna be 10 times my one char. I'm gonna write that three times so I can think about what I've got to do. The next time through, this has to be a nine. And this has to be an eight. So I've got to have this sequence. I've got, I'm going from, my variable is going from one to nine, but this expression has to go from nine, from 10 to nine to eight. And so I think my expression is going to be 11 minus X. Yeah, 11 minus X will give me that number right there. Give me that stream of numbers. So this will be 11 minus X. And I think this is supposed to be times the one char. So if we do all of that math, that should produce 130. It's kind of collapsing this uh, into this part of the problem, adding all that together, and that's going to give us 130. So let's go ahead and take this interim number in. And we'll use that as our new example going forward. And let's stop it right here again. Uh, and let's see what checksum is. Yeah, checksum is 130. So that, uh, that does it right. Uh, do we, would it be helpful if we kind of went through this, kind of step through this and watched it go step at a time? Or are we comfortable? So if, if someone wants me to step through this, let me know. So a few of us are, a few students are saying, let's go ahead and step through it. So let's go ahead and do that. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and bring up another window here called the locals window. And that's not going to be helpful because it's so tiny. So we'll just use the immediate window to be able to see what we need to see. I'll stop this, put a breakpoint here, and I'll run it again. 
Okay, so this, the first time through this, x is going to be 1. Let's go ahead and step through this. One char right now is 0. And so, <clears throat> sorry, one char now is a zero length string. Let's go ahead and step through this. Okay, so now one char has pulled the first value off. So one char should be zero here. Uh, let's take a look at that. And one char is zero. It might be helpful to have these print up here. So one char is zero. Checksum right now is zero. And so we're going to take the checksum. It's going to be equal to what it used to be plus 11 minus. 1, which is going to be 10, times 1 char, which is 0. So after this, it's still going to be 0. So 1 char, let's go ahead and just print x, 1 char, and check sum. Let's go ahead and go through a little bit more. So f8. So now we're pulling off the next character, should be 3. So one char should be three at this point. Our checksum now is going to be equal to zero, which it currently is, plus 11 minus two, nine times three, so 27. So I'll step through that and come check these. And we should now see that we've got 27 uh, building up here. And that is the first, you know, zero was the first one, now the 27. Next one will be zero, so let's go ahead and step through that one pretty quickly. So now our one char is six, so we're looking at this character. And so now our checksum is going to be 27 plus, uh, what is X right now? X is four, so 11 minus four, that's gonna be, Seven, took me a minute there. So that's gonna be seven times six. And so that should be, should give us 42. And then it should add the 42 to 27 and we'll get whatever 42 plus 27 is. So let's execute this line. And kind of check these values. I uh, kind of expected to see, oh no, because we don't, we don't capture this interim number here. We're just adding it on. So we're looking at that six, and now we are uh, at 69, which is going to be 47, uh, 42 plus 27. Yeah, 49. And so it's going to generate this stream of numbers, and it's adding them all together into our checksum variable. I have Questions? A question. Go ahead. Um, why can you have a numeric function on one char when it's a string? So. Uh, the question is, why can we have a numeric function on one char when it's a string? And the answer is, it's not a numeric function. It's a string function. Um, so if we look at one char, oh, I'm sorry. You're talking about this. Uh, one char is a string. Uh, sorry, I misunderstood the question. One char is a string. How can we multiply that string times this number? And the answer is, before VPA gives up, it looks at that string and it says, we really can't multiply a string times a number uh, unless I could convert this into a number. And so it looks at this and goes, oh, you know what? I'm just going to convert that into a number. And it does the conversion for you. Now, the truth is, we have a problem because we could be bringing an x back into the wrong place here. Our algorithm right now allows us to have an X somewhere besides the last character. And so it could end up in our ISBN. So it's probably helpful for us to do this and say, if one char, if is numeric, if not is numeric, U -M -E -R -I -C, one char, then something has gone wrong. We shouldn't have anything that's not a number at this point. So if that's not, see, is numeric. Yeah, so if that's an X, then not, is numeric would be false. Not is numeric would be true. If that's true, we want to exit the function. Then exit function. Okay, that was helpful. Thank you. Have an X. In 
where we've already stripped off that last character where the X is allowed to be. So now we're saying, all right, listen, if this is not a number, then we better get out of here. Uh, and that would return false because if we bump into a non-numeric uh, value in the first nine characters of the ISBN, it cannot be correct. All right. Yeah. So, um, so Professor, there's a question. Yep. Um, wouldn't you want to do that like probably before you get into your for loop? So you said, wouldn't you want to do that before you get into your for loop? So the question is, oh, that's a good point. I didn't really think about that. I'm doing the is numeric here on one character at a time, but I think what you're saying is that, hey, the whole thing has to be numeric. So once we've got ISBN narrowed down to here, we could just say, if not is numeric, don't, no reason to look at them one character at a time. We could look at the whole ISBN, which at this point is just the leftmost nine characters. Um, then this lets out, yeah, this is, this is simpler. I think it belongs out here. Thank you, that's a good point. It would work fine where it was before, but it's kind of, it's kind of cluttering up the loop and <clears throat> Checking more often than necessary. This, let's just do it with one check. That's great. Okay, so after this loop runs, we've got our interim value here. And so our next thing to do is just to take that value and do mod 11. Now, you may not remember mod so much. So, uh, but you may remember doing long division back when you were in fourth grade. Uh, <coughs> and so, you know, if you were to do long division for uh, something like, um, you know, 21 divided by five, uh, you would end up with an answer of four with a remainder of one. Um, so if I was to do this, 21, divided by five, I get a decimal response. If I do 21 integer division by five, just the other slash, then I get just the part of that fourth grade problem before the remainder. And if I change that to do the mod function, then it will give me the remainder. And so mod is just the remainder of a long division problem. So what this is saying is it's saying take 130, divide it by 11, and give me the remainder of that. So I don't need to keep my 130 around anymore, so I can just kind of keep using check sum as I'm building that up. So check sum equals what it was mod 11. And so that's gonna get me down to this position. In fact, I'm probably gonna go ahead and run it there to make sure that it's actually nine at this point. Just check my checksum and it is nine. So I'm feeling pretty good about that. This is then saying our next step here is to take 11 minus that number. So I'll do that with another line here. Checksum is now gonna equal 11 minus what it currently is. That'll get me down to two. Just go ahead and run that line. And check sum is two, so that's what I expect. And now the last step here is just to um, take that result mod 11. So we'll do that with one more line. Check sum equals check sum mod 11. And that gives me then the answer that I'm looking for. Now, <coughs> problem is if we have an X is our check digit, X is the value that's used for, um, I mean, we're, we're doing mod 11 here, the remainder divided by 11. So what are the possible values that could come out of this? The possible, the, the possible values for any number mod 11 are zero through 10. Because if the result is, if, if the result, if the remainder is 11, you did the first part of the math wrong. You could have you know, increased the quotient by one without having to worry about 
uh, and then having no remainder. So the only possibilities here are zero through 10. Well, the problem is that we want this to be a single character. And so what they said is, oh, let's just use Roman numeral 10 to specify 10, which is why there can be an X in an ISBN check digit. So now let's just go ahead and do this. Our check sum at this point uh, is going to be the is going to be what we've calculated for the check digit. So let's do this. Let's say if the check sum is equal to ten, and my check digit. is equal to capital X, then we know we found a, we, that, that this was valid. We calculated the checksum, we went through the whole algorithm, we calculated it, came out as 10, uh, and the check digit that was passed in was X, that's, that's correct. So we'll say ISBN, oh, I guess we're already there. And we'll say ISBN is true. Excellent. Well, if that's not the case, what's our next possibility here? Well, then we want to say else if our checksum is equal to our check digit. <coughs> Then we'll set it to true. We'll also set it to true there. Is there any other possibility? So this is a special case. If we calculated 10 and the check digit is X, then return true. Otherwise, if what we calculated was a check digit, return true. I think that's it. So now, go ahead and stop this. Now I think we can run this. That tells us it's true. We should be able to change this check digit to something else, and it should be false. We've got type mismatch. OK, so our check digit is x. So let's do it this way. Let's say if the check digit is X, then we'll drop into here with another if statement. Here we'll say if check sum is 10, then we'll do this. So if our check digit is X, the only possibility that we can get to true is if the check sum is also 10. Otherwise, we're done checking. I think I should be okay. Put this back to a two. Should be able to change any other single number. It should still be false. Should be able to transpose any two numbers. So we'll change three as the first one, make zero the second one. And that should fail as well. So I think we've implemented uh, a pretty good algorithm for that. And just realize too, of course, that we can now put this into a cell as well. We'll put this in, have this refer to A5. The value there, fix that number so that it's the right one, change my three and my zero. So we've made that function in VBA. We can use it anywhere you'd use a function. So over here in Excel, you can do it from inside of VBA and so forth. Okay, that concludes the instruction today. We'll take uh, one more chance for questions. Any questions? Can you show us, uh, I just need to see the valid characters function one more time. I'm getting an error in that function. 
Yep, here's the valid characters function. And of course, I'll post this right after class. Thank you. All right, folks, thanks for coming. Uh, we'll see you Saturday morning at nine o'clock right here on Zoom for a review for the exam. Thanks for coming, class dismissed. Could you scroll up a little bit, Professor? I will, stand by.